Welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. So last week we checked out what would happen if you bought a guitar off of eBay. Now I guess that video wasn't necessarily 100% fair. It was more so geared towards, you know, buying from a seller that doesn't sell a bunch of guitars. Because obviously if you bought from me on eBay or another well-respected dealer, you'll get a good guitar. So this time I thought we would try out Guitar Center. I have ordered not just one, but three used instruments from Guitar Center that I felt they were a pretty good deal, but let's see you know how they actually pack the stuff see if they actually described it correctly because their photos aren't the best but starting off here they've got good packaging materials in here but they've done absolutely nothing to stop the guitar from moving I mean you can see this slides back and forth so as far as a pack job their materials are fantastic but they need to train their employees on how to minimize that movement and of course, every Guitar Center store is going to be different, and these all came from different stores. So we'll get to see how different stores do stuff. But hey, at least they used a box, they used good packing materials. I'm not complaining, I'm just suggesting that there were better ways to do this pack job. I'm guessing this is the one that we bought live at that guitar hunting episode. But just from this, even the case is a little bit more worn than I was hoping for. Looks like we got a small Tolex area that I need to glue back down. But that's nothing too bad. Our first find in this Gibson USA case. Oh, wow. Okay, so this is the one that we bought together. Ah, very dirty case. Now, sometimes that's just glue staining because that just happens sometimes. And it doesn't smell bad. So I think that's going to be the case on this one. It just kind of looks ugly. But here we go. I think if I remember correctly, this was described as a 2010 Gibson Les Paul Studio pinstripe edition. And I thought, okay, 2010, that's awesome. That's before the Rich Light era. Uh, then I did some more research. This was a 2014 limited edition run. So I was a little bit bummed out about that because that means, yes, we definitely have Rich Light on this guy. But I guess if I would have done some more research, it would have been okay. But that is something that somebody messed up on this particular listing. But I can definitely see how that happened. They looked at the serial number and they took this and normally that would be 2010. But 14 is the first year where they adopted that year year system instead of the year day 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 year but as far as our condition here um that's looking good no real breaks cracks or repairs i mean this was at a shop floor somewhere so it definitely needs some sort of a cleaning i've got to say i'm pretty impressed with the condition overall i'm not seeing anything that's like uh too over the top or that should have been disclosed so yeah i would say i am happy with this purchase and they even detuned the strings. So I would give this whole transaction, what, a B plus? They could have done a little bit better on the packaging, but hey, it's definitely passable. The only thing I need to check is to make sure the truss rods are still good on these guys. And yep, that one looks fine. And uh, it could definitely use a, about a quarter of a turn to get some of that relief out, but the neck itself is straight, so we're okay there too. Right, and now these two. I did not buy these live, but they were influenced by me finding that one that one particular night because I always just thought Guitar Center used. Um, I really don't think I'm ever going to be able to find a deal there. But there were always people telling me, check these things out. Sometimes there is a deal. And now that they list the used inventory on a Musician's Friends website, it just makes it kind of a no-brainer for me to also check those out occasionally. So what is number two from Guitar Center? This one was packed by somebody that's a little bit more knowledgeable. You can tell there's very little movement. I have no worries about this one. They did a great job. Oops, that's not a Guitar Center guitar. We'll unbox this one next week. There we go, here's the one I want. It's, it's a very similar box. Okay, so as I was saying, since I shop on Musician's Friend website a lot, I just happened to find this one on the launch day of the Adam Jones Signature Les Paul, because I was looking for that one. And this just happened to show up in the used listings. However, I broke my cardinal rule with this guitar. And I'm hoping that it doesn't come back to bite me in the butt. <laughs> 
there's something on this particular instrument that I vowed just to not buy anymore, but oh well. It's the finish. The finish I had to do it. Test the pack job. I'd say that's adequate. I would like to see less movement this way. At least I've got this movement secured, and that's the most important one, because if you get a big oh, boom, that's what breaks your head stop. And hey, it's a Gen 3 chainsaw case, so I don't think we have too much to worry about. Big and bulky case that protects it. Looks like one of our latches came undone, but hey, that's okay. Well, without any further ado, let's just go ahead and open this one. Nice! It actually has the Gibson badge on it yet. I like to use these as decoration whenever they fall off, hence that one. So, what's in here? Oh, just kidding. <laughs> this is the other one. That's the guitar that, that Kai kind of started that story with. This was such a pain in the butt to buy. Because I was trying to haggle in some free strings and stuff. <laughs> I was on the phone with that guy for three hours, you know, going through a whole bunch of different managers to get this. I paid what I would consider a fair market value for this guitar because I fell in love with it. And I'm sure if this was on Reverb for the exact same price, it would have sold nearly instantaneously because this is a beautiful 1982. I mean, check out this three-piece maple top and it's a natural finish. I'm not gonna call the natural finish rare, but you don't quite see it as often. And this one just had some really nice wood grain. But what really sold this one for me is the back. One piece, it's got that nice ringed wood grain to it. And then I just knew, looking at the photos, that this neck had some very interesting stuff going on too. Because you get a really wide flame in pretty much all three pieces. This is a very active neck. And they didn't really disclose this in the listing, but you could just barely see it. It's marked a factory second, and I have never seen a second stamp be so tiny. Because normally it's right up here, it's giant, they really mar this. So I 1000% believe this was a factory employee's guitar, and that's why it was stamped so nicely. But this thing is really clean in condition. I am seeing like next to nowhere on this thing at all, wow. But the other cool thing that made me pay so much for this one is it's got all the special 80s parts. Being in 1982, we have the diamond posi lock strap lock buttons. We should have the Tim Shaws in here. I'll have to verify that. Otherwise, that would be a not so good buy. Unfortunately, we are missing the stickers. That's the one thing that this one doesn't have. But we've got the nine point adjustment bridge. And take a look at this. We get the flip out winding tuners. These 82, 83 Les Paul Customs, sometimes you can find it all the way into 84. They're very special and they sell for quite a bit because of all these special things on it. So as long as our neck is good, and it is fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I am super happy with this buy. It was well worth the effort to make sure that this deal went through. So uh, thank you to all my musicians friend guys who worked on that to make this thing happen. As long as our truss rod's not maxed out, I think we should be okay. Oh boy. Well, that puts us in an awkward situation. I would consider that toast. Man, that's such a shame. That definitely uh, makes me question Guitar Center's uh, vetting process. That is way past limited adjustability. At that point, when there's that many threads sticking out, you're likely just taking the truss rod up and up. That needs to have some sort of a repair. So unfortunately, it makes no sense though, it's so clean. How could it have been adjusted so much? What a shame, I think this one's going to have to go back after all that. They were really good about the return though. They gave me a proper return label instantly, so I'll be sending this one back on Monday. But what even kills me even more is all the original paperwork was also in the case for this guitar. So the truss rod makes no sense on this example. I only wish I had a local luthier that I could pay him 200 bucks just to fix that rod and then you'd be good to go on it. 
Man, and here I was just about to apologize by saying, oh, I know this seems like a super positive Guitar Center video. How about you go buy stuff from Guitar Center? It's a sponsored video. Nope, that, that just proves to you that it's not. <laughs> I really hope this one's not too bad because that's the one downfall that this new migration hasn't really figured out yet is at Guitar Center, you have three days to return vintage products, whereas used, it's 30. They don't really have that laid out on the musician's friend thing. So I hope there's no issues on this one, but I'm sure they would still do the right thing even though we're outside of that three day period. I just wanted to wait till I got all three guitars at the same time to make this video. So how's the pack job on this one? Again, they just need to uh, use their bubble wrap a little bit smarter because they're using the right stuff, just not using it quite right. But hey, you got another Gen 3 chainsaw case. So this is the one that I found when I was hunting for the new Adam Jones. It's not an Adam Jones Les Paul, but it's pretty much the closest thing. What cardinal rule did I break? Oh, oh Jesus. What happened to this thing? That was not in the photos. <laughs> okay then. Well, the first shocker is this thing has a Kaler, but in the photos they did not say anything about paint chipping and peeling off the top. Like, that's the kind where it, it doesn't look like water damage, but I'm not, I'm not really sure. Maybe it happened when somebody installed the Kaler, but that's the thing. It was supposed to be a factory Kaler, and I can tell it's not just by looking at that. So far, this, this one's not looking so good, but hey, <laughs> we've got the Tim Shaw pickup rings right there. I guess what I would ultimately suggest for this one, if you do get it, maybe have somebody shoot a clear coat over top of this. That way it doesn't continue to chip. Ah, I don't even want to look at the truss rod on this one. But thankfully it doesn't look like it's got any breaks, cracks, or repairs. Except for obviously the added this, but even in this condition, I think this thing's worth more. So I think I'm kind of stuck with it, but I think we'll be okay. What is this? I'm actually impressed that they have a trem bar arm. So it looks like somebody has this dinky little one that you can use. And then the original style one that's also here. Oh yeah, <laughs> double trim bar, man. All right, let's see what our news is up here. Oh sweet, it's a mahogany neck. What year is this? I guess it's 85. They were back to mahogany by then. Yeah, that actually looks okay. And the neck definitely needs a light adjustment, but as far as the straightness, you know, this way, we're all good. So, um, I, I guess I was just a little bit shocked at first. Thankfully, it's not like, uh, you know, peeling, peeling up. I, I mean, if you picked at this, you could get it to come up, but, um, yep, yep, see, right there. Yeah, let's not touch this anymore. <laughs> But that is a good lesson that it's just the outside layer that turns that yellowish color because of the clear coat. The finish itself is still silver. Honestly, at this point, I was a little bit disappointed with the purchase, but I wanted to know more about this. Was it actually a factory Kaler? Is the paint chipping actually caused from cracks from somebody installing it into the body? These are things that I could not answer without tearing this guitar apart. So let's go ahead and take a deep dive. 
All right, so in cleaning this guitar, making it at least semi-what presentable, I thought, hey, what if I convert this back to a stop bar tailpiece? Because thankfully the studs were there, I just had to add these parts. Because I was very well convinced that since that says Kaler on it and not Gibson, that it was not a factory Kaler, because that's what I've always been told. But I'm sure there are exceptions to that rule, and I think this might be one of those times or somebody just had to replace the Kaler at one point in time. I mean, first off, the Kaler route in here is very clean. Now, just because it's clean just means it was professionally done. I always thought that the Gibson ones that were routed for this actually had paint in the cavity, but I guess I could be wrong because the one thing that's making me think, okay, this actually probably was a factory Kaler is up here. Okay, so when you take off the locking nut that I have over here, are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? The only screw hole for a truss rod cover is up here. And if we were to line that up, that lines up to nothing. And that is not the correct location for a truss rod cover. So if you move it to the correct locations, you can see there were never any holes drilled for a regular location one. So this had to have at least left the factory with a locking nut on it just based on that evidence. So I think even though I just happen to have all these parts that I could make it the way that most people will want to buy it, I really think I should put the Kaler back on it because I do agree with them, it was likely factory. But I was able to clean this gal up. She looks a lot better now. It's not completely disgusting to touch. And I was even able to polish up this area. Now, obviously I was very careful. I think that was just a fluke that that area was really loose because everything else, it looks terrible. I I'll agree with you guys, it looks really bad. But as long as you're not really picking at this finish, I think you'll be okay. But I would heavily suggest anybody that does buy this guitar from me, please take this to a luthier, get a nice little clear coat over top of that. That way you can still have that cool aged look, but it's not actually going to flake on you because this is the only part of the guitar that has any of that. Everything else is perfectly good. I believe it could be due to moisture damage because I was thinking, oh, maybe when they routed the Kaler, they crack the body or something. But thankfully, that is not the case on this one. I what likely actually happened with this is somebody put their guitar down next to a heater or next to a fire and it heated up the finish and caused it to slightly blister. That would explain why it's only like this in one area because if it was due to moisture or humidity damage or flood damage, you would see a lot more evidence of this over the entire guitar. So I think heat damage is the most likely culprit, maybe. So your guess is as good as mine. But our knobs are original. You can tell because of the bold font that they used. Remember, in the mid 80s, they switched what they were making their knobs out of. They don't yellow with age as much anymore. And hey, our pickups are still the original Tim Shaw's. So that's a big win. And you can see the original silver color within the uh, cavities here. As far as the frets go, unfortunately, there's some pretty heavy wear on like the first five. I would say this definitely needs some sort of a level recrown job. So I would say third fret B string, that's definitely the lowest. So if you don't mind really low frets, I think you'd be fine with a level recrown. But if you like the modern stuff, it's probably just time to cut the cord and do it. But beautiful ebony fretboard. The only place I see any like fingernail divoting is in the second fret right there. The nut is like super low on this guy. That must have something to do with the Kaler. But our headstock now looks nice and clean. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to leave that choker on it though. So here we go, got it all back together. Put the Kaler in. I mean, now you don't have a big gaping hole and the headstock at least looks correct for what this one's supposed to be. But my goodness, the action was literally a mile high. Okay, maybe not literally, but it was definitely slide guitar playing. I don't, they definitely had zero <laughs> setup on this at all. So I at least got the uh, action to be completely playable now. And I'm happy to say that the fretware does not actually appear to be, you know, majorly affecting the playability as of right now. So you can definitely play it as is, but hey, at least we uh, cleaned up the front of this guitar. It's not completely disgusting to touch. There's a slightly musty odor to it, but not like really bad. This is just kind of like a vintage guitar that hasn't been cleaned in a long time scent. So let's go ahead and uh, flip it over and work on the back now. It's amazing after a little bit of TLC, how this quickly went from, ah, oh, I kind of regret my purchase to, man, that's a beautiful silver burst. And all that finish checking on this stuff, that's the real deal good stuff. <laughs> and yeah, down here it's a little bit ugly, but, but check it out on the side right here. This thing's got a lot of character to it. Especially right here, easy to see it in that lighting. But as far as the back, 
kind of an interesting finish. Doesn't really come to a point like most of them do. It's kind of a, a more rounded shape, I guess you could say. But everything in here is looking perfect. The pots date to 1985. This one says the 25th week of that year. And that matches up pretty well with the serial number. And not a lot of wear and tear on this. I mean, it's got some buckle worming, but I think out of all the silver bursts that we've talked about this past week or two, this is probably the cleanest back that we've seen. Now, as far as the neck, you do have some light impressions and whatnot. And unfortunately for my preferences, there is a little bit of clear coat wear. So you can see through to the silver finish, completely smooth in that area. We've also got all the finish checking. And the side that you see while you're playing also has a little bit of wear. But at least it's not like completely chewed up off of the neck. Even though that's the way the Adam Jones aged ones look. Honestly, I hate that look. I like it when you actually have the silver burst on the back. But no breaks, cracks, or repairs on this guy. And our serial number dates it to actually really late 1985. So this is like one of the last silver burst customs they did. Because you really start to see this finish fall off after about 85, 86. But I think 88 is the official last year until they reissued it in the early 2000s. I think it was Sam Ash that first did it. All said and done though, I'm surprised. Only 10 pounds, 6.6 .6 ounces. This feels like a 14 pound boat anchor. It has to be the Kaler system. So if you take that off, I think it'd probably be around 10. That's just a guess though. But I can definitely see what people talk about when they say a Kaler kills the tone. Like I don't feel this thing vibrating at all anymore. Now, I'm sure once you plug it in, it's probably just fine. You just don't feel quite as resonant anymore. But at least you can convert it back if you want to, and you'll just have a big gaping hole and a weird looking headstock. In the end, after we unbox these three guitars from Guitar Center, would I suggest buying from Guitar Center used? No, not without calling the store up and getting in-depth detailed photos. I mean, that's why they've got people there. So you can't just buy this stuff sight unseen off of Musician's Friend, unfortunately. I would not suggest that because there were a couple of nasty surprises that could have been prevented with a phone call. So if you do happen to find something on their used site, Maybe just uh, give them a call to make sure it's actually something you want. But after a little bit of TLC, uh, I'm happy with this purchase. I just wish I would have known that the finish wasn't just checking, it's also flaking off. But even in a worst case scenario, their return policy was fantastic. So yes, you can buy with confidence, but you might be a little bit disappointed at what arrives and it could inconvenience you a little bit. So take that for what you will. That was my experience buying three used and vintage guitars from Guitar Center. All right, let's go ahead and move on to some boxing now. Needless to say, this was a strange one. Not my favorite Gibson guitar in the world, but I'm glad I can say I've done it because, you know, it was an interesting Zach Wilde signature guitar. I much prefer the Les Paul signatures, but, you know, these are kind of collectible guitars. They didn't make a lot of them and they'll never be making these things again. So, you know, if you're a weird, quirky collector and you like the Zach Wilde stuff, I mean, seek one of these things out. And now we need to send this back to its rightful owner, the Jackson Roswell Rhodes that I was lent in order to make a very fancy Halloween video for you guys. I had a lot of fun checking this thing out. The tuners still scare me a little bit just because I don't 100% know what I'm doing. <laughs> But ever since the Modern Flying V came out, I wanted to check one of these things out. But I was kind of too scared to buy one myself because the market seems to be all over the place. Most dealers seem to ask anywhere between like seven to 9,000, but I just recently seen one from a private seller for around the mid sixes. So I haven't really tracked the market enough or played around with one myself to know enough. So I'm glad I could have a risk-free trial of the Jackson Roswell Rhodes. Thank you Troglodytes for tuning into this boxing unboxing episode. I hope you enjoyed getting to see all these interesting guitars. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Share the video with a friend who you think would enjoy it. And we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.